What's up, guys, and welcome to the Ted Jones World Podcast. And oh boy, do we have a special one for you today with wins over Pete Sampras in singles and the likes of Andre Agassi, Boris Becker, and Stefan Edberg in doubles, director and star of the famous documentary Journeyman. We have Mark Kyle all the way from Hawaii. Mark, how's it going, man? Aloha. Thanks for having me on your show. Dude, I really I really appreciate your time, man. And uh, just everything tennis-wise and watching the documentary when I was probably like 10 or 11 years old, it really interested me more in the game of tennis. You know what I mean? I, I was never really thought I was going to be a top 10 player. But ever since I was playing tennis, man, I always had aspirations to see exactly what the pros were doing and everything. So I guess we'll get this podcast started by asking you, what was your first memory of tennis, Mark? Well, I grew up in the Albuquerque, basically was born there in New Mexico. And uh, I just started, my sister was five years older and she was a really good junior. She ended up uh, uh, being from the 12th to the 18th top five in the USTA national rankings. And she ended up uh, being number five in the ITF world ranking. She lost in 1979 in the finals of the U S open juniors. Oh, wow. Uh, so she was in the quarters of the French open juniors and she went to UCLA and they won the NCAA team championship. She played number one and then she got top hunter WTA. So she was five years older. So I looked up to her. So I just followed in her footsteps, got her hand me down sweats and rackets and started playing at a couple clubs in, in Albuquerque. My parents were hobby players. And that's the first memory is just growing up in Albuquerque. And there hasn't been any pro tennis players I don't, other than my sister and I that ever really come out of the state who graduated high school. My sister left her junior year and went to uh, uh, California to work with Paul Cohen, the infamous coach in the, in the uh, King Richard movie. And that was so he she was his first pupil or first star uh, back in the 70s and uh, before that she worked with Landstorp but it was my sister who got me into the sport and now she's uh, playing a lot of pickleball she's got a couple of kids she lives in the southeast uh, she lives outside of Austin in a, in a retirement community and uh, yeah so that's my sister was the first one but Albuquerque New Mexico high altitude tennis you know the weather wasn't that great uh, you know, snowed in the winters. There wasn't any indoor courts until later, uh, but it was a great, great upbringing. And, and I have still have a lot of good friends from uh, the Duke city. Before you went to USF though, were there people in your town, coaches, maybe other players being like, you got to get out of New Mexico if you want a serious chance of going pro? Well, I never ever thought I was ever going to be a pro tennis player, even when I went to USF. So uh, my sister was the one who was the child prodigy. I was just I was ranked 100 in the nation. I played the Kalamazoo the last three years uh, uh, from the 16th through the 18th. Last year, 16th, first year, 18th, and second year, 18th. But I didn't do very well. But I did pretty well in doubles. I got eight in the nation with Richard Benson from Utah. And so uh, I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot. I wasn't really highly recruited. Uh, and, and I wanted to go to UNM, where my dad was a professor. And they didn't have a full scholarship because my dad said, you probably you need to get a full ride because of, you know, you, you've been working pretty hard at it. And so I wrote a lot over 100 schools with a form letter and USF answered. And back then it wasn't as big as a program as it is now, but they offered me a full ride, Bill Perrin. And I went down there and then I just made a big jump being in the, in the low altitude and, 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 and the great weather and uh, good competition. We played FSU Miami, the, the Gators. And I played number one my soft, my freshman year in the fall in the spring, and uh, yeah, and then and then in the summers. Uh, uh, but getting out of New Mexico was probably a good idea. I don't think I could have been a pro. Uh, there's been a guy Tim Garcia who came out of New Mexico in the '70s. He qualified three times in the uh, U.S. Open, but other than that, there really hasn't been anybody that came out who graduated high school. So. I'm pretty happy about that being the goat of New Mexico tennis. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. I was go. Gonna say, so Let's go. And I'm proud. I'm proud to say that people are like, oh, he's there. I'm the goat of New Mexico. Hey, it's just there's only a million people in the state, but I moved to Hawaii uh, when my dad got sick uh, about seven years ago. And uh, he was he he transferred here to be a professor. And I kind of like the vibe here and it's good. Going to Kalamazoo those last three years, was there a time during that tournament? For those of you who don't know, listening and watching Kalamazoo, the biggest junior U.S. 
tennis tournament you could be a part of. If you win the 18 and under junior tennis tournament, you get a wild card into the U.S. Open main draw. Was that still the case back then? Yes. And what? so would you say that playing Kalamazoo and just seeing that atmosphere, was it completely different than anything else you'd seen in your junior career? And you were like, I want to play as serious as I can moving forward. No question. Uh, Kalamazoo is a zoo. It's the Nationals. But I really really fell in love with the sport it, it, when I was about 14. They used to have this equitable family tennis challenge where mother, son, father, daughter, father, husband, wife. And if you won your city and section, you got you to gotta play during the U.S. Open against the other sectional winners. Equitable sponsored it. So when I was 14, my mom and I won our New Mexico in the Southwest, and we went to New York during the second week of the Open. And I was like, wow, this is what I'd love to do. Uh, you know, I, I, I never really watched my sister play pro tournaments because I was a little younger, but uh, yeah, it wasn't until when, that was the eye opening experience of like, I'd love to do this, but it was such a gradual, gradual, uh, progression. And of course I would have liked to make it top hundred. I only got to 167 in singles, but I did make a living playing doubles and I did qualify for the ATP pension. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. I don't think many people know that to be able to, to qualify for a pension, you get a stipend from the age of 49 to 69 if you finish five years in the top 60 ATP and uh, top 150 in the singles. And you have to have five credits. It doesn't have to be consecutive years. It's crazy. So I got five, I've never heard of that. That's crazy. Yeah, I got the five years for, for, for doubles. And unfortunately, I don't think the WTA has it. And we got Billie G. King trying to do all this equality in other sports. So I think she should concentrate on getting it getting the WTA pension, you know? She's a great lady. I played world team tennis for the Idaho Sneakers for her. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was a, it's, it's been a great journey. Having early success in doubles, did you see yourself being a guy who was going to be around the qualifier of the Grand Slams in singles, but then somebody who was going to really, you know, potentially make the year-end tournament in doubles? How did you see singles and doubles differently throughout your career? Great question. I, to be honest, I never thought I'd be a pro until in the summers of my, uh, of college, I played the futures and I did quite well. I did better than in college. Where did you, uh, where, where did you play those futures? Did you go to Africa? In the Europe? States? No, oh, in wow. the States. I, I, okay. I, in the Southeast in Alabama, Jasper and, and like Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I finished, I finished second on a satellite and uh, uh, I did pretty well. And, and, and then, my sophomore year, I got into some challengers in South Africa. I took my finals early, and then I came back, and I was ranked 268. I was the second highest ranked college player in the, in, in, in the world. Who was one? Jeff Tarango, infamous Jeff Tarango. Yeah. He was top I remember, you know, you know I, I, I remember Jeff, I think, vividly just from the meltdown he had at Wimbledon that one year. I know he's made it to the third round a couple times, but he just, like, packed up his bags at Wimbledon and left. I remember that great moment he was on nbc world news for that incident i ended up playing doubles with him for a year great player great guy very eccentric guy went to stanford okay. he's a little weird but i like him <laughs> uh he, he's you know he, he he was a great player and uh we played doubles together but uh yeah so then i got a sponsor i was I, I i my teammate's father was a uh, professor i mean was the owner of a ten a golf academy he was Japanese, and he said, I'll give you 30 grand a year to go on the tour, and, and we take a little percentage of your prize money. So then I left middle of my junior year because I felt a little stagnant in college, and then I started to play. And then and then subsequently, after a few years, I realized that I didn't have the quickness nor the mentality to break in the top 100. I had my opportunities. After I beat Pete, I was main draw of 10 challengers, and I could have broke through. I just didn't do it for various reasons. Uh, I lost first round like eight out of the 10. So, but, but then getting, I started doing but well. Getting into the, since we're talking about Pete, but getting into those challengers, were you getting all main draw entries or some yes. wild card? Okay, main draw. Because wild. when I, I was ranked 160, 60 ish after Pete's, and then I got into 25s and 50s in the summer in the States, and I had my opportunity, but for some, just, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, I didn't believe there was a few reasons, quickness. Uh, but I had my opportunity and my evolution stopped at one, but then I started doing well in doubles and making a living and, and doing well. 
just because I think because of my background of serving and volleying in Albuquerque, now they play a different brand of doubles. They they don't serve and volley, but back then everyone served volley, first serve, second serve. So I started to do well in doubles and I started making you know six figures in doubles. And I bought a house in Tampa, but I was I was based in Saddlebrook, practiced there and practiced at Palmer Academy with some great juniors. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was, you know, I played 12 years and it was, you know, I was there with all those big guys. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. For those of you who haven't seen the documentary Journeyman, you can find it on Vimeo, correct? That's where I watched it. Yes. One, it, it, it literally, it takes me back because it's so similar to how today is in terms of how everybody's always holding up their phone, getting the video. And the craziest thing is you're on the court with Goran Ivanisevic, Australian Open, and you guys are, I think you guys are down down a break or something. And you just have the camera right here and you're like, dude, what do we got to do, bro? Which is just, it's, it's so refreshing to see something that fun uh, take place all those years ago, man. Was there like, when you were recording this documentary, what was the vibe of the other players? Were people kind of digging well, what you were doing? Well, it's interesting. This was before. Out? Thank you. Yeah, this is it's interesting. This was before the pre-Kardashian, you know, uh, uh, reality shows. <laughs> you so were, this yeah, is this had never one. been done. This was yeah. in the late '90s. So I bought this little portable camera, and I I I I, I was having some problems. Just I needed a hobby at the end of my career. Mind you, this was at the end. I was much more professional. Been in the film of journeyman for the first 10 years i filmed the last two years with a great guy and great player who's doing great in 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 tenafly new jersey jeff grant we became partners and we combined our footage and we played doubles a little bit but it was like the players were like so shocked they didn't think any they didn't think anything was going to happen with it but being i'm german i was organized and i and i, and I, I love filmmaking i love movies love jaws love watching movies I said, let's, it's never been done before. So Jeff and I uh, went and we, uh, and we did it and uh, we, we, we filmed for two years. Then we made a little trailer and we had to shop it around. It was hard. We went to the TV trucks at all the tournaments, showed them our VHS tape saying, do you know any production company who would like to take our footage and make a film? It took us another six months to find the production company, RDF in England. They said, we'll do it. They took it. And they took our footage. We sat in the editing room with an editor, a producer, and Jeff and I, and we cut the film. And uh, then it was aired in 11 countries. We made a little cash, not much, but because it was a documentary. But it's, you know, it's, it was a catharsis. I needed a hobby. I was, I ended up getting divorced. And it was at the end. I wish I could have shown some of the highlights when I was really much more professional earlier, but that's okay. It was, it was something that that needed to be, it never been done. And it, it, I'm just, it was fun, you know, and we never thought it would get the recognition it did. And then subsequently uh, now they have the uh, Netflix uh, uh, document docuseries, which is, is still, still too vanilla for me, but it's nice. I, I'm, I support it. I think it's a great idea. It just promotes tennis. What do you mean it's vanilla though? They don't have enough, uh, Behind it's just like it's not really geared towards a tennis person who knows knowledge of the tennis. It's just geared towards the casual fan. And uh, I heard the F1 Formula One series was just a little bit more open. I mean, you know, uh, it's still they're still guarded, you know, because they're so famous now with all the Instagram. I, I think it, they could have showed, you know, Baratini sleeping with Tom Jonovich, you know, let's have some more, <laughs> let's have some more, let's have some more sex. Let's have some more sex in it. Well, we tennis needs to get tennis needs to get sexy. And speaking of sexy, bro, look at this freaking look at this guy here. Hold on, can I pull this this picture down of you, dude? I don't know if we had the full. God damn it! I'm trying to show this picture of you at Wimbledon. Was this right after you qualified? This was well. The qualifying's played at a different site. Yeah. But uh, 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 that was when I was just the first day. I went over to the site because it's played at Roehampton, and then I walked over. And uh, that was my first round match, I believe, against uh, Mark Petchy. Uh, yeah, and so the other photo was me just being really excited because you're you're at a different club when you play qualities. It's a different club. Courts aren't as nice. And then when you get to the biggest, most important tournament in the year and you qualify, you're just so elated. I was just I never thought coming from Albuquerque that I ever play at Wimbledon, and it was a great experience. I did it twice, and then I did I played I played mixed doubles on center court against Davenport and Grant Connell, a good team. I played with a great player, Laurie McNeil. So yeah, it was, it, it, you know, Wimbledon to me is, 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 is what it's all about when you're growing up as a kid. 
when you beat Pete Sampras at the Queens Club, did opportunities come outside of tennis? Was there like a moment where Nike came to you and they were like, all right, Mark, we got to get you on the commercial. I know that you got into all these challengers after, but that was just purely based on your ranking. Was there any sponsors that came your way after the win over Pete and news coverage? I was 24. I guess I wanted to see what I was going to do, but I got, I had a nice, I got a contract with Reebok and I used to, I was the first guy to get a contract with Oakley before Luke Jensen, right? Like a week before Scott Davis. I, so I wore sunglasses, but it was all performance based. If I did well in a tournament, like if I got the semis and the doubles, then they would give me uh, 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 some cash, but I never signed a big contract. No, it was is never that kind like. Of, is that it, Mark? Sorry, don't mean to interrupt. Is that kind of how it works today? Where if somebody who's like 120 in the world, whatever, they beat Nadal or something at the first round of the Australian Open, is that kind of how uh, companies would come in and then start making a performance base and then they'd sign you to a year deal, two year deal? How does that look? Is that kind of similar? I think I, I'm not real familiar with it. I've been out of it for a while, but I think it's the age. If you got a young girl like this young girl who did well on Driva, I believe in Madrid, she's 16. She has got people all over her now wanting to sign her. I think if you're under 20, they look for young, good looking players that are younger than they Marketable. do in their later in their later ages, I think. But uh yeah, so no, I wasn't really recruited highly by any companies or anything uh because you know i lost the next round of malavea it was it was you know i you know i was happy you know because at that point i was 24 and I, if i didn't do anything kind of big i was going to go back to school and get a real job but then i started doing well in doubles what do you think your best year was 93 i would say 94 95 in doubles i got to the finals of the swiss indoors basel Federer's hometown i got i won a million dollar tournament with Tarango. We split a hundred grand. I bought a Porsche immediately after Let's red convertible. Dude, yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you also about journeyman too. Federer in that match. What was that like one of his first big career wins when he was like 18 years old in that, in that, uh, that was his moment? first. Yeah. Well, career, he was still, he was the number one junior in the world. And he, he had he won had like won orange Lord. bowl. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, and he got it and he was with IMG and then, that was a that was journeyman two. What isn't as good because I did it by myself with just a regular editor. We had a professionals for journeyman one, but I'm done with that with journeyman. No more, I, I, no more sequels. But yeah, journeyman two is an okay film. It's, I don't think it's as good as journeyman one, but Bro, I felt like it was. Mark, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. <coughs> why couldn't you potentially do a journeyman three? Well, I got rid of the tape. I just felt like it's over. It's in the past. It's it's redundant. I've written a couple scripts. Uh, one on the life of Michael Hutchins about in excess. I've wrote another tennis script. I'm just trying to move on. I wouldn't mind making a feature film with the screenplays that I've written about the life of Michael Hutchins, former lead singer of in excess. Okay. And uh, you know, I've been shopping that around, but it's so hard. It's like it's like comedy. I basically have given up, but it's okay. I, I I'm happy with the two journeyman one and journeyman two. Uh, films but though but it's done it's 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 over you know jaws 2 was not as good as jaws 1 it can't get any better in my opinion that's it journeyman 1 journeyman 2 and well, bro, uh, we'll to go. be honest though shrek 3 and shrek 1 i i hold in like it's high, both high regards so okay okay all right <laughs> well jeff's got the remaining footage maybe he'll do it uh i haven't spoken to him in about seven years uh i, I hope he's doing okay we're still friends. We still get along. I mean, the screenplay won uh, won a prize at a script writing contest. Wow. I mean, it's a good screenplay. It's just it's it's a big budget film, but you know, hey, with the Ted Jones World Podcast, you never know who's going to see it. Absolutely, bro. What are some of the things that you look back on in your tennis career where you think, okay, maybe this was a time where I should have taken it this direction? Was there like a moment that you look back on? where you're like, I'm really happy I made this decision, or maybe you could have made another decision and things oh. could have gone different ways. Is there well, I could have been, I could have been, yeah, I, I, I probably should have been more single just, just to have more time, you know, with myself. And yeah. I had met a beautiful Swedish woman and we ended up getting married. Uh, but that wasn't really a half. I think, to be honest, after I beat Pete, I should have had my coach, Alan Webb, come with me for those 10 challengers just to get over the hump. And be more professional and really, and, even and though I was. You, did you feel like financially at that moment when you beat Pete, you were like, all right, I have all this money. Let's go. We could do it ourselves. 
Well, I had the 30,000 a year, so, and I've been playing and grinding on futures and satellites. I won a challenger in Jakarta in singles, 25 plus age. I got to the finals of another one back in college. So I just felt like, yeah, I was working pretty hard. People think I'm a joke, Jeremy, but I was training four to five hours a day, doing the plyometrics, lifting weights. Obviously, now I need to do that again because I've gotten big. But uh, other than that, it's, yeah, that was a time when I should have had a coach come with me because, I, you know, you only get a small window of opportunity to break in because everyone wants to be in the big dance, the top 100. It's like getting invited to the best party in the world, being top 100. But I didn't do it, but I stopped 50 in doubles. So I'm pretty happy with being top 200 and top 50 in doubles. And then I coached for 20 years, giving some knowledge to people on and off around the world. Uh, I had some mental health issues a little bit and and, and, and partying a little bit after I stopped. I, I really uh, I went through a divorce, but it was uh, it was a great experience, Ted. Thanks for, for bringing me on. I love it. Bro, I really appreciate it. You're like an open book, man. Are there any tennis players that you still stay in contact with that you'll see when they come to Hawaii or you kind of just are out of the tennis loop? Well, right I keep, an, I keep, I mean, I was pretty good friends with Pete actually after that match. Cause he lived in Tampa. He had a mansion. I bought a little smaller house, but he had a big house in a gated community. He had a brand new nine 11 and we became friends cause we trained at Saddlebrook. And you guys I were just, know, poor, you guys were just Porsche bros. We were, but I had a 944 S2. Yeah, exactly. I copied <laughs> him. He used to take me out to, it was a great, it was, I call it the Roman empire of my life from 18 to 32. I dated a Hooters girl. I dated a Tampa Bay Buccaneer cheerleader. I felt, I thought I was the real shit. And uh, unfortunately now nothing's going on, but no, but it was, it was, yeah. Pete took me to dinner. You know, we, you know, we went out like 15 times. So I was friends with him. I haven't spoken to him since I was a volunteer assistant coach at uh, UCLA in 06, but uh, you know, he's, he's a quiet guy. Very, I learned a lot from him though. Learned a lot from Goron uh, playing, you know, traveling around with him. Uh, and I learned a lot. I'm, I'm friends with TJ Middleton. I'm good friends with my old partner, Pete Neborg uh, from Sweden. Guys that you probably, they're not household names. I, I keep in touch with Neborg, Middleton, Dave Randall, the guy that I broke through with in doubles. But as far as the famous guys, uh, I saw a go on at the Miami Open a couple of years ago, uh, about seven years ago. But but other than that, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I was an alumni member. I haven't been one because I'm so far out here. You get free tickets. It's 300 bucks a year. If you are a certain ranking, you get a you can become an ATP alumni member and they give you free tickets to any ATP event. So that's why I got into the Miami Open. Has there, not yeah, been one, there hasn't been one in Hawaii yet? No, there. It's a worldwide organization. I just live way out. Oh, an ATP event. There was. I played once. It was a. It was called the uh, Hawaii Open back in in the late. They 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 have exhibitions here at, in Waikiki once a year, but they did have for one year at the Turtle Bay Resort an ATP event in the nineties, and I lost first round. We were up five two in doubles. I played with Mike Briggs from Newport Beach, <laughs> and uh, we lost to Nice and Sook. Up 5-2 in the third. My dad was watching because he was a professor here. So, no, but as far as me being an alumni, it's just so far out here. I'm not really a member because I don't I don't feel like traveling. I traveled 40 weeks a year for 12 wow. years, Ted. And I'm just tired of getting out. You know, those planes were rough. I was I was traveling coach, too. Do you still see Patrick Rafter? I spoke to him through email, told him he's the man of all men. Love the guy. I have not seen Patrick. He should come here with his wife and surf. He's got the cash. I went to Australia seven times to play. <laughs> he, he is he's such a class act. I'd love to see him. His wife, Lyra, is a great woman. Uh, they were she was friends with my uh, ex-wife. Uh, Rafter is, you know, he's he's a little bit under the radar. He lives in uh, the Gold Coast in Australia. But hey, they can call me. Fuck it. You know, why do I have to call them? You know, I'm the journeyman. Well, yeah, dude, you're the guy. Mark, so I, I know that qualifying for Wimbledon was one of your proudest achievements in your pro career, but do you have a, a specific moment in your tennis life that stands out where you were like hanging in the player's lounge, shooting the shit with guys who are top 10 or any advice that people gave you or things that you remember specifically? Well, I met with Peter. He was Swedish. This is a kind of a, this is, I'm bragging, you know, we went to the Hollywood nightclub in Milan and there was 
models and we met these two Swedish models and we actually played our first round at a different club. Peter and I, we won our first round. And, uh, and then we met these at the Hollywood nightclub, these two Swedish. Oh my God. No, but so what about, what about in journeyman Two? your boy who was talking to that girl for like 15 minutes. And she was just, that was, she was Mark Merkelein, like, Mark Merkelein, Mark Merkelein, good looking guy from the play of the Gators. Great career. She was, that's how it was. I mean, it was, it was nice. It was just, there was nice things going on at the sites. Cause you know, people came out and watched and, you know, in between practices, you'd walk around and meet people and it was a lot of fun. And, 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 and I was friends with Boris was always kind to me, gave me a hug every time. Uh, you know, Boris has had some, you know, went to jail, you know, and he, you know, it, it's, I, I can deal with that in the sense that I had some tough times after I stopped playing. You still think you're on this roller coaster, but you got to be, you got to budget your money. And, and uh, yeah, so Boris was cool. Stefan Edberg was very tight. He wouldn't buy me, you know, he was very tight with his money and he still has every penny. No, I'm just kidding. I love Edberg. Uh, but that's, you know, those guys were, uh, Mott's V Launder was really cool. Uh, uh, you know, it was just, I was just really happy to be there, you know, and I was just happy to be there because I never thought it would ever happen. Wow. Even though I was basically just a double specialist coming from Albuquerque where there's, you know, not many players came out of there and, and it, it was fun, Ted, you know, probably like your adventures on the comedy tour now. Do you see a huge difference in between now and when you played or not really? I think it's all relative. I'm sorry. There's more tournaments now. If you're 122 in the world in the 80s, 70s, 90s, it's the same as 122 now because there's more tournaments. Tennis was popular in the 90s. People forget. They think it's always the now, now, now. There's so much depth. But granted, these players are much more physical. They work. I, I do think they're more professional because we didn't have teams with us. If you were a double specialist, you only a few of them had coaches. So you were on your own and you can end up getting in trouble because at night you come home to the hotel, you're all hanging out. It's a fraternity. You're staying in a nice place because they give you a free room. You got a tr courtesy car to take you where you want. You go down to the lobby after a hard day of training or playing. You talk to a couple mates, have a, go have dinner, have a couple beers. And then sometimes if you lost early, because there's only a few guys doing well every week, you'd head to, they had a player party every week with the nicest people coming there, beautiful women. Cause it was kind of like the, in every city was kind of like the end thing during that week, you oh, know? Wow. Okay. And you know, like in Madrid, they have a player party and, and, and now the ball girls in Madrid, have you seen them? <laughs> They're models, right? It's a joke. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's the way to do it, you know? So, I mean, who was who was your best friend on tour? Would you say? Was it Jeff oh, it, at a it, period of time? Like, how did, how did you guys maintain that relationship? It, it, it varied. It depended on which stage of futures. I was good friends with a very famous coach now, Craig Boynton. He's, uh, he's coaches Hercox. He was a good friend, funny guy. And uh, that's why he's been on the tour, because he's really well-liked. He's acknowledged. He got to about 400 great guy from Tampa, went to Clemson, Craig Boynton. Then, then there were Scott, Scotty Patridge and the San Diego boys, Bruce Steele, guys that were like, you know, what Bruce smart guy went to Dartmouth. And then I played doubles was Patridge. And then it went on to Dave Randall. who was a very religious, you know, we were, we were good on the court, but off the court, we didn't spend much time together. He's the best player ever out of Mississippi. He's a director of tennis at a club in Jackson, and then there was Peter Niebuhr, who I had the most fun with, the Swedish guy. I mean, it's always good to play with the Swede, Ted. Always <laughs> good. Do you have anything to say to tennis parents who are raising a child in today's day and age? Do you say that you want your kid to be a professional, obviously, but is there a, a limit to how far you can push your kid before they say, I don't want to play this sport anymore? I just feel like I, I like – I'm not really into the specialization. I think the, the younger they get into the sport, they really need to concentrate. And just, you got to play every day from the age of, in my opinion, unless you're super talented from the age of seven or eight. till. And that's all the way kind through. of, Mark, and that's kind of how I felt, you know, in starting to play tennis at 10, 11, 12. Once I started entering these tournaments, there were kids who were beating me 6-0, 6-0. And then I, if I ever caught up to them, it wasn't until the 15s and 16s. And then those kids are already, you know, 20 in the East or something like that. You know what I mean? You got to start young and you just got to play a lot. And uh, you just got to, and you got to have fun though. It's, but to, 
to get to the next level, you got to be almost psychotic about it. It's got to be your life. You really got to love it. I read all the magazines. I knew all the players. It can't just be like, oh, I play tennis and then I go play soccer. In my opinion, if you want to excel, even at the, you know, the national level now, I mean, there's great players. You got to be, you know, look at this Brian Shelton's kid, Ben Shelton. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's an amazing player and, and, and he didn't even leave the States until now. And, 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 and it's just, it's just practice and just working hard, just like anything in life, just like you work hard at being a comedian. This has been a terrific episode. I, I think before, before we get out of here, one last question I want to ask you, who was your best win in practice? Because people who are watching and listening don't play tennis. There's still a lot of harp on people beating each other in practice. Did you have a big win in practice that you can uh, you can take home as an award? I lost a set to Federer 6-4. No wins. I lost. And, and Courier, I used to practice with him, but he would serve in volley. I beat him, but he was serving in volley. And this was at Saddlebrook when he was number one in the world. So wow. he was working on his game. But... Yeah, practice was just like playing, in my opinion. That's how you get good. I was very intense. And being at Saddlebrook, you know, a, mile, a few miles from my my house, you, you play, you know, I never, I only practiced with Pete once. He was very just into drilling and then doing a lot of off-court stuff. He was so talented that he didn't really need to hit that many balls. Although he did a lot of off-court with Pat Etcheverry. Barry. And, uh but practice, I beat Courier once. And I lost to him in the main draw of a challenger in South Africa in a tournament, 6-4, 6-4 at the beginning of his career. I lost to Federer, 6-4. I hooked him on the baseline at Queens. Uh, <laughs> on a, and he he kind of like, he he, he, couldn't, he didn't know what to do. Because <laughs> well, he, he was young, right? He didn't want to stand up. Yeah, he was young. Head. He was young. He was yeah. young. And I, I went out to dinner with him a couple times in Italy and Rome when he was coming up, you know, if I saw him now, I'd be like, hey, you've gotten a little bit better. Now he's doing the Met Gala. Boy, uh, yeah, it's hey, you great. you saw him last it's night, great. bro? He did a quick shot. He was like, it was fresh. Yeah. Bad man. <laughs> Mark, when are, you, when are you coming to the U.S. Open? When are you coming to New York, man? I got to come there. I got to come there. I got to come there. I got, you know, I'm sure Boynt maybe hooked me up with a badge or something. I got to come to New York. In, in the next, I will. I will. I will. Thank I will. Ted. And I'll come say hello to you, Ted. Good luck with everything. And uh, you were a great player. And I'm so proud of you. I'm sure this tennis has transcended over to being comedy, working hard really has, every really day, has. doing something. Mark, I really appreciate your time, man. And the story you have crafted a, a, around your life is truly incredible. For those of you who have not seen Journeyman, you really have to check it out. Mark, can you tell us where we can find it, please? Vimeo.com, the journeyman. Well, number one, journeyman two. A beautiful film. Mark, thank you so much, bro. And I'll see you in New York or Hawaii when I'm there. All right, dude? Come on out here for stand-up gigs. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much, Mark. I'll talk to you soon, bro. Bye.